Good morning. Good afternoon. I want to continue our study in the book of Daniel. But one of the things that I wanted to examine is as we get into Daniel chapter one is considering who Daniel is. What is his status in the grand scheme of God's plan? And so um as I was thinking about this, and um, my mind went to a series of messages that I'd heard growing up um, about the remnant. And I was thinking, well, Daniel's one of the remnant. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of that, that image of those who remain true and faithful to, to God and and so I want to examine that idea for a minute, but let's start in Daniel chapter one and read there. And then after that, we're then we're going to Jeremiah chapter 24 in just a minute. But in Daniel chapter one. It says here in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, that is, the king of Babylon, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge, understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. So if you wanted to think of it, they passed the um, they became the SAT eminent scholars. These um, children and Daniel, of course, is one of them. Verse five, the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So nourishing them three years that at the end thereof. They might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. We'll stop there. So Daniel is a it, from a particular category of people, particularly the elite um, intellectually, um, socially, you know, being of the king's. Uh, a, a descendant of the of the princes of Judah, and um, smart, evidently a, a, able to learn, able to learn languages, uh, science, and everything. You know, if we think of the ancient standard of education after the Egyptians, of which Moses had learned. The second standard was the Babylonians, and they were 
quite adept, particularly in astron astronomy, astrology, um, and and other sciences. But astronomy is extremely important. And we'll see that astronomy actually plays a key role in uh, Daniel's understanding of the scriptures later on. In other words, God's able to take whatever tools that we learn and apply them for his purposes in order to reveal himself to us. And we can see that in the case of Daniel. Now, back to this idea of the remnant. Is Daniel part of the remnant? So, um, I kind of, unfortunately, I came with preconceived ideas. And I started doing my study. Um, I went to the concordance, looked up the word remnant. And to see, you know, who are the remnant? Does this apply to Daniel? Uh, things like that. Of course, the word itself, remnant, simply means leftovers, that which remains. And in modern terminology, it would be applied to, um, it would be the term minority or somebody who is um, left. Um, let me hasten to say that Christians in America are not a remnant necessarily and are not a minority in fact we are a majority you know evangelical christians are a majority in the united states and um we therefore uh we need to keep that in mind as we um go forward so what does the Bible say about the remnant? And I, I was actually quite intrigued about um, this, and I was completely off on my assessment. So first of all, First Kings, um, one of the key promises that we want to claim uh, from the remnant is from First Kings chapter 19. First Kings 19 uh, says 19 and verse 30 and 31. I apologize. Second Kings. Second Kings 19, 30 and 31 says, And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant. They that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, shall do this. Um, let me hasten to say that the, the, con the context of this passage is um, during the reign of the kingdom of Hezekiah. Okay, so it was about 120 years before the fall of Jerusalem. But it was during the As Assyrian uh, siege that this promise was made. Okay, um, and then First Chronicles 30 is the parallel passage. It's kind of saying uh, a similar thing. Second Chronicles 30 and verse 6 says, And this is this is after this. This is the um, uh, 
This is the revival of the days of Josiah. Second Chronicles 30, verse 5. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come and keep the Passover under the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. So the post went with the letter from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah, and according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. Now, so we have this promise to a remnant of Israel that the Lord's going to bless them at, if and when they repent and they return. Um, but the same term of is also applied to a curse. The same term remnant is also applied to a curse in Second Kings twenty one fourteen. It says, "I will stretch out over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth the dish, wiping it and turning it upside down." And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. They shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies, because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day of their fathers came forth out of Egypt, un even unto this day. So the point that I'm making with this is that we have to be very careful of the context in which the word remnant is used because it could be leftovers of those who are faithful to the Lord. It could also be leftovers of those who are descendants of Israel, but who are not faithful. So either one of those scenarios could apply to um, the remnant. But by far and away, the greatest use um the greatest number of cases in which it was used is are those in the book of isaiah and that was in my in my mind um concerning you know who are the remnant isaiah has many prophecies about the remnant but it's not who i thought it was again it's not who i thought it was um we have to be very careful and i confess this this was my mistake Coming to the Bible with preconceived notions, we have to let the Bible say what it says truly without uh, bias. Isaiah 1 9, this is one of the uh, particular verses that uh, is quoted. The daughter of Zion, uh, Isaiah 1, 8 and 9. The daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, what hath, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are of trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear, because your hands are full of blood. So Isaiah's famous... Um, Prophecy from, from his very first chapter about, Come ye, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your hands be as 
scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They will be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. In Isaiah chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 37, chapter 46, each of these um, places is talking about the northern kingdom. It's talking about Samaria. So it can apply to Judah and Jerusalem. <clears throat> um, usually when it does, it's the curse. It can apply to Samaria and Ephraim. And when it does, it's a promise that if they return, the Lord will preserve them. Another one of the famous uh, scriptures is Ezekiel. As Ezekiel is considering what the Lord's curse is regarding Jerusalem and Judea, he says, he asks the Lord, Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 13. And it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died. So the Lord told him to prophesy against this false prophet. Ezekiel prophesied, and the false prophet fell dead in the meeting. That doesn't normally happen. Um, it, it's fairly rare, yet it happened in this case. And so we want, um, so Ezekiel cries out, then fell I down upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, ah, Lord God, wilt thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? Will thou make a full end? In other words, if the Lord starts counting our failures and starts counting our trespasses, there's no one safe. There's no one who will make it. And then our last um, set of citations about the remnant um, is in the book of Ezra, where it says whenever um, the captivity from Babylon returned under Cyrus the Persian, Reestablish the the um, kingdom there, not the kingdom, but um, a faction there in Israel, and then um, started putting their minds towards possibly rebuilding the temple. There was a group from Samaria. They were called the remnant of Israel that came and wanted to be part of this new king, new. Um, republic, new province. And so they were the remnant of Israel, of the northern kingdom. So, in other words, my point in all this is that the, the picture of the remnant is much more complex than I thought it was at first. And it doesn't necessarily apply to Daniel, even though I thought it did. The other places, whenever it's mentioned in Jeremiah, it's again referring to the cursed ones. And so this brings us to our passage in Jeremiah chapter 24. Jeremiah chapter 24, because this is a parallel, a correlate of what was happening um, in the third year of Jeconiah. Um, well, actually, it's later um, looking back at that. But the Lord is giving clarity. So the Lord is giving building this metaphor um, for Jeremiah to help him understand what are um, what is the situation of the children of Israel. This is a short chapter. Um, we should get right through it. All right. The Lord showed me and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. 
After that, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. The princes of Judah with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem, and it brought them to Babylon. So parallel to Daniel chapter 1 is this Jeremiah chapter 24, right? As soon as this group got to Babylon, they were en route. They were being separated out. The king, Jeconiah, was captive, his queen, um, his princes, others of the royal seat, including Daniel, Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah. Um, God gave Jeremiah insight into what he was doing, and he gave him this vision. And I, I bring this back up again because... This metaphor of the good figs and the bad figs, the good figs and the bad figs, is, first of all, um, such a powerful metaphor. But I am I, constantly thinking about it in, in deciphering the historical events that were taking place there. Brother Johnny, uh, you know, preached on it a week ago uh, in, Jer in Jeremiah chapter 29 about the letter that Jeremiah sent to the people there in Babylon. Said, you know, build, um, plant gardens, build houses, and um, give your children in, in marriage in order that you might increase and not decrease. One basket had very good figs. Even like the figs that are first ripe, and you see here in our illustration. The other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten, they were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? Now the Lord had showed Jeremiah many pictorial visions, just like he showed Peter, the sheep coming down out of heaven. There in the book of Acts, um, all through the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah had been shown pictorial visions. And this is one of the most prominent or to me, my mind, most pervasive metaphor. What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, figs, the good figs, very good. And the evil, very evil that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of Chaldeans for their good. Like these good figs, that's how I acknowledge. Now, this word acknowledge is so powerful. This is the relationship. This is the um. This is the acknowledgement that God gives. This is the seal that he places upon the lives of these who were carried away captive into Babylon. Um, we even see that later that the king Jeconiah himself repented in, in his chains in prison and his relationship with the Lord was reestablished. And because of that, then the Lord gave him favor before the king of Babylon. Verse 6, Jeremiah 24, 6, I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. So there is a promise that the good figs are going to be brought back at some point in the future. This is the best part right here, verse 7. And I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. So the Lord actually 
brought them back to himself through the process, through the crucible of this captivity. It wasn't to destroy them. It was to separate them from the policy, the politics, the uh, kingdom of Israel and the way it was trending. But it was to preserve them, their soul. And we see the effect that it had on Daniel and the three Hebrew children, right? They purposed in their heart not to defile themselves. The Lord put in their heart to seek him in whatever way they could. And let me point out that um, in Daniel's uh, experiment, he wasn't trying to influence Babylon to change. Babylon was what it was. It was Babylon. It was the foreign kingdom. He wasn't, um, his purpose wasn't to change society. His purpose was to maintain himself pure before God. And we can't do that in our own strength. It is only, as he says here, as the Lord gives us a heart, he fills us with a conviction, he gives us his Holy Spirit, he, um, the, that resurrection power that empowered um, Christ to, to, to raise from the dead is the same power that is acknowledged for us that we might know him. And then look what it says about the evil figs. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue, or the remnant, if you want to use that word, of Jerusalem that remain in this land, of them that dwell in the land of Egypt. So Zedekiah was a was um, a, an uncle of Jeconiah that was carried away into captivity. He was a son of Josiah. But we notice that his name does not enter into the um the genealogy of Jesus, whereas um, Jehoiakim and Jeconiah does. And the reason is he was a bad king. He was a vassal king under um, Israel. I mean, I'm sorry, under Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar set him up as a vassal king in, in Jerusalem as long as he was true. But, of course, he rebelled after 11 years and brought the second wave of captivity um, on the city of Jerusalem. He would not acknowledge the plan that God had going on in Israel, that God was cleaning house. He said, no, we are going to. We're going to stand alone. We're going to make it on our own. We're not going to submit to um, Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to go down to, to Egypt to get help in standing against Nebuchadnezzar and rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar. And, of course, they were defeated. So in another, in another picture, these two baskets of figs ended up being pretty much the definition of Jeremiah's ministry. After the book of Lamentations was written, after the first fall of Jerusalem, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm mistaken about that. The Lamentations was written after the second fall of Jerusalem. But even after that, Jeremiah's ministry was not fulfilled. He continued on among the dregs of society there in Jerusalem, carrying out his ministry, and actually he was held as a hostage 
there. He was dragged. And so that's the whole story we have from Jeremiah 40 on about how he was dragged to Egypt with the rest of them. The whole time preaching that they couldn't succeed, that this was a fool's errand, that it was a suicide mission. And yet not only did they go contrary to his preaching, but they dragged him with them as a hostage. And so Jeremiah 40 through 44 is that whole Jeremiah being right in the middle of the basket or bag of figs. And verse 9 says in Jeremiah 24, And I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And I will send the sword and famine and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. So this is the remnant. Um, so this is the term remnant actually applies to the bad pigs mostly throughout the book of Jeremiah. And so it's an important as we study the scriptures to work very hard at understanding the context, double checking our sources, double checking our historical references, double checking our dates, double checking the historical context, double checking the usage of words in different contexts. And it was a it was a good um, reminder for me in going forward in, in this study. And um, I'm thankful that God chooses to bless us, chose to bless Daniel and the three Hebrew children. You see, through this process, um, they stood for truth. Again, it wasn't about um, it wasn't about uh, their their existence, the existence of the remnant did not guarantee the preservation of the kingdom of Israel, unfortunately. And that was one of the, the points, um, you know, that if there's a remnant in, it, in Israel, that God won't destroy the city. But unfortunately, that's not the case. That... Um, That construction um, is not accurate for um, for for us to understand scripture. There, there's no promise like that in scripture. The promise that God gives us in scripture is that He will take care of the remnant, that they will be His. They will have a true and full relationship with Him. But as far as um, that being any kind of guarantee for their um, political stability or their economic prosperity, it, it's not it, it's not a one to one correlate for sure. The Lord may use them, but he may give them peace and stability in another situation, like Daniel. They might find their peace and stability in the court of the king of Babylon or somewhere else. And so I think that that's a, an important understanding for us to come to. Remember, the Lord is faithful. The Lord is true. The Lord is doing his work. And the Lord is working on so many levels. Um, the, the thing that surprised me the most was the, promised, the, the promises that he gave to the remnant and those that were, um, that were focused on 
the remnant were for the remnant of Israel. God was giving a special set of promises to the remnant of the northern kingdom. God was um, working with them, bringing them back, reincorporating them. And if, if we had time to get over to some of the future prophecies, uh, the prophecy in Zechariah, for example, uh, I would love at, at some point in the future to get to the book of Zechariah. There's a whole set of prophecies there that are extremely important. Um, but in that prophecy, he has um, the prophecy of the re-melding, the re-welding of the two kingdoms back into a single kingdom. And that prophecy is true. And so... Whenever we think of Samaria, when we think of God's um, plan and purpose with the Samaritans, that's what we're thinking of. We're, te we're thinking of God's treatment of the remnant or the promises to the remnant specifically being applied to the Samaritans. And so when we get to the New Testament in under the, the covenant of Messiah, there in Acts chapter 2, the Samaritans are included in the mission, right? Go ye therefore, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the ends of the world. And so God is working through his people to reincorporate Samaria into his people. And it was many of these... You know, particularly the the Pharisees um, that remained in the in the city of Jerusalem that were completely against God's work among the Samaritans. So the final point is God is involved in so many projects on so many levels with so many groups. Let's not miss what he has us to do. In that regard, let's not miss the mission that he has called us to, no matter what our status is. Let's not miss the mission. The Lord add his blessing to his word.